Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Lahu alhamdul hasan wa thana'u al-jameel. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabiyyina Muhammad al-Bashir al-Nadhir wa siraj al-Munir. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala gami'an nabiyyin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-tayibin al-tayirin. Amma ba'd. My dear respected brothers, we begin by thanking Allah Jalla wa ala, the most merciful, the most kind. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enabling us to gather here in a very blessed gathering, the gathering of knowledge. So let us all thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity, with devotion, with humbleness. Alhamdulillah. Imam Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, a man who recognized the need for us to attain knowledge and utilize the time accordingly. Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala, his adah, his habit was that he would sleep a small amount during the night. It is said Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, he used to sleep only three hours. On an instance, occasion, he slept an extra hour. Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala, a man who lived, as the scholars say, ma asha illa khamsa wa arba'ina sana. Only 45 years Imam Nawawi rahimahullah lived, but he left, left a fantastic legacy behind. So Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, he slept that extra hour on top of his book, making the best out, out of his time. And then when he woke up, he said, Inna lillahi laqad adana zamanan tawila. He woke up and he said, Inna lillahi, ex expression of regret. And he said, Laqad adana zamanan tawila. I have wasted a huge amount of time from my life. Subhanallah, we're talking about just an hour. These are the noble people. They might have passed away. They have passed away. They have departed from the life of this world. But their legacy still remains amongst us. Not only Imam Nawawi, that's just one example. Imam Ibn al Qayyim, rahimahullah, the person that we will be speaking about today, inshallah. Another gem or profound individual from amongst the Salaf, Al Mutakhirin. The latter scholars, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. So often we think his name is Imam Ibn al-Qayyim. It's Imam Ibn al-Qayyim. Qayyim is one of the names of Allah. So if we were to say Ibn al-Qayyim, that would be wrong. So it's Imam Ibn al-Qayyim. Qayyim has two meanings. One of those meanings is Qayyim means precious. And the other meaning is uh, principle. So he was known as the principal son, hence uh, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim. He studied in his uh, father's institute in uh, Makan, uh, in a place called al Jawziyah. So insha'Allah, Aziz, before we actually go into uh, the topic, the chosen topic, let us have a quick brief of who Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala is and what this book is about, insha'Allah ta'ala. So this book, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he compiled, it is known as Madarij al-Saliqin, the stations of the traveler. And it was a commentary that he done from another book known as Manazil as sairin which also means the station uh, of the passerby, the one who is traveling, who lives in the life of this world as just a mere traveler. That book was written by Abu Ismail al-Ansari al-Harawi, a scholar who was, not, who was from Herat, a place in Afghanistan. So he did the commentary of that book, which is known as Manazil as sairin and he named it Madarij as saliqin so he begins this book, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, by doing the tafsir of Surah Fatiha. So in the introduction, the tamheed, the preface, as soon as you open the book, you will find uh, the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. And after that, he explains many stations that a believer journeys through. Uh, under iyyaka na'bud wa iyyaka nasta'in. So while we're living our life, worshipping Allah solely, asking for his aid solely, that is a journey for us. So there are many stages within this journey. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim explains in his book, Madarij al-Saliqeen. Inshallah, we will go through. So Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, who was born uh, Hijri 691, and he passed away 751. Okay, so very concise life, like Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, 60 years only. But subhanallah, the legacy that he has left behind. If you look at his works, absolutely amazing, the works that he has left behind. Till this day, we are benefiting numerous books that he has uh, left behind. So amongst, amongst uh, his shuyukh, we find Imam al-Zahabi, uh, the great scholar of hadith, uh, and a very senior authority in criticizing the narrators of hadith, Imam Shamsuddin al-Zahabi. And then we find al-Badruddin ibn al-Jama'ah, another scholar, 
uh, that was from his teacher. And I'm only mentioning this to really understand the maqam of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, who he studied under. To be able to recognize this man and his authority and his maqam, we need to know who his mashayikh were. So Imam al be a very well-known uh, name amongst the ulama, uh, as-salaf. Walaykum as uh, Badruddin al-Jama'ah. And then we find Shaykh al-Islam Hafiz ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, who was his mentor, his, one of his main uh, teachers and you can say to some extent father figure to be able to understand his relationship Imam Ibn al-Qayyim's relationship with Hafiz Ibn al-Taymiyyah rahimahullah we need to look at an incident that took place between them <coughs> Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he says uh, one day atanawal shaykh mubah I was indulging in something that is mubah all of us are aware of what mubah is something that doesn't carry any sin nor does it carry or warrant any reward it's not a benefit for the Muslim it's not a benefit for the believers because it doesn't have an effect on our mizan our weighing scale so Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he saw Ibn al-Qayyim atanawal shaykh mubah he was indulging in something that is mubah doesn't carry any sin nor does it carry any reward Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he says faraani shaykh al-Islam Ibn al-Qayyim uh, Ibn Taymiyyah saw me faqala Inna hadha yasuddu an maratib al-'aliyah Ibn al-Qayyim this is what is holding you back from attaining a lofty status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just mubah something that has is not being you, you won't be questioned for mubah so that was their relationship that guide he, the guidance he got from Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala the, the spiritual guidance the knowledge and that mentorship he got from Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. So they were his uh, mashayikh, the more, more renowned uh, scholars. From his students, uh, Hafiz Ibn Kathir, Imaduddin Ibn Kathir, the great Mufassir, uh, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, uh, and then Imam Zahabi as well. So Imam al-Zahabi, not only was he his teacher, as well as his student as well. So you'll find amongst the Salaf sometimes, uh, some of the ulama, uh, they're, they're teachers of their students and at the same time they're their students as well because of the level of knowledge or perhaps in Islamic theology some of the scholars they focused on fiqh while others focused on hadith so they took knowledge from one another so Imam Ibn al-Qayyim now just through this brief introduction of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim we can gather his kaliba, his maqam, his rutba where Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala is in terms of uh, his uh, knowledge so inshallah let us uh, folk, uh, move on uh, to the chapter itself the chapter is fil asbab al jaliyah lil mahabbah wal mujibah laha wa hiya 10 Imam Ibn al Qayyim he chose this uh, subject this particular topic to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 10 ways 10 remedies 10 points that will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attain the qurba the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we find, my dear brothers, one of the prime reasons why we have distanced ourselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The distance between us and our Rabb, the Khaliq, and the distance between the Khaliq and the Makhluk is becoming far greater day by day is due to our involvement in disobedience. In order for us to eradicate that distance between the Khaliq, yani we are the Makhluk, that distance between the Khaliq and the Makhluk, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gives us those 10 points. He says if a person is able to grasp onto those 10 points, implement them within their life, then they are treading on a path that will lead them towards attaining the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he called this chapter, Fil Asbab al Jaliyati lil Mahabbati wal Mujibati laha wa hiya ashara. 10 causes, 10 reasons, 10 ways a creation of Allah Jalla wa ala can attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first point, as most of us are aware, and I know some of my dear brothers have done uh, some back, uh, background uh, study as well, uh, it's to really reflect upon the Quran, its meaning, to contemplate, to understand the Quran, and why he brought this as point number one. Why do we think Imam Ibn al Qayyim has brought this as point number one? Out of all the points, why would Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah choose this to be point number one? It's the first concept that you have with Allah. Hmm. Barakallahu feek. Are we missing out? Any other possible answer? Out of all the points that Imam Ibn al-Qayyim chose in this chapter, 
why this specific point to be in this numerical order? So this to be number one. So he himself, he explains, he says number one, of course, as my brother rightfully mentioned, to emphasize its importance. The Qur'an is up here. So number one, he put the Qur'an as number one, point number one. Number two, to portray that the Qur'an is the door to the other topics that are yet to come. So all the topics that we will be going through as we proceed, whether it's dhikr, whether it's uh, nawafil, whether it's any other points, you will find all of those points within the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is rather the door to the other points. And number three, to portray that the Qur'an is the door in attaining the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most uh, effective ways of attaining the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is uh, his explanation or his reason why he chose this to be point number one. To attain the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brought point number one, yani the Qur'an. Uh, <coughs> so to understand this specific point, point number one, to reflect upon the Qur'an, understand its meaning, so on and so forth, we need to reflect upon a verse from the Qur'an, Surah Ibrahim. Surah Ibrahim, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, alif lam ra, kitabun anzalnahu ilayka li tukhrija al-nasa min al-dhulumati ila al-nur. So we're looking at point number one now, inshaAllah. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he speaks about a very important verse from the Qur'an. He says, in order for us to understand point number one, we need to reflect upon a very important verse to understand point number one. Alif Lam Ra, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk li tukhrija al-nasa min al-dhulumati ila al-nur. Allah Jalla wa Ala has revealed the Qur'an upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For what purpose? Asbab al-nuzul. What is the purpose of revelation? Li tukhrija al-nasa min al-dhulumati ila al-nur. To take mankind out of the realms of darkness towards light. That is the purpose of revelation, asbab and nuzul. That is the sole purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an, to take us out of immorality, indecency, to take us away from that what is unlawful, and to take us towards that what is lawful, that what is correct, and that what earns the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is uh, the purpose of revelation. My dear brothers, if we look at this verse, if we analyze this verse, we'll find Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka li tukhrija al-nas min al-dhulumat. That he has revealed this book to take us out of darkness. Look at the word dhulumat. The word dhulumat, it's in its plural. Okay? Whereas, li tukhrija al-nas min al-dhulumat ila al-nur. Nur is in its singular. Because dhulumat means darkness. There are many ways a person can become misguided. Many ways a person can become astray. There are many paths that lead to becoming misguided. However, there is only one path that will lead us towards success. Ihdina Sirat al The one path. Hence, the verse uses Nur in its singular because the path of guidance is only one. Hence, Nur, yani the light, is only one. And there are many ways a person can become misguided. Hence, he used Dhulumat in its uh, plural. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that the key purpose of the revelation of the Qur'an is to take us out of the realms of darkness towards uh, light. But how would that take place if we don't understand the Qur'an? If we just merely recite the Qur'an without being able to contemplate upon its meaning? Not knowing what the Qur'an uh, is referring to, a particular surah that we study, but we're not sure what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to, the message that this surah carries. If we're not able to understand that, how do you expect that transition to happen where we are taken away from the realms of darkness towards light? If we don't understand the Qur'an, Imam al-Tabari rahimahullah ta'ala, he used to say, Inni a'jabu. Imam al-Tabari, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, the great Mufassir, he says, Inni a'jabu, I'm shocked, astonished. Mimman qara' al-Qur'an, for the one who recites the Qur'an. وَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ تَأْوِيلَهُ And he doesn't know the meaning. Just merely recites the Qur'an. And he thinks that's the purpose of revelation. That's the purpose of asbab and nuzul. The purpose is just for mere recitation. He's inni a'jabu. I'm shocked. مِمَّنْ قَرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ The one who recites the Qur'an. وَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ تَأْوِيلَهُ the one who, And he doesn't know what this verse means. Why Allah Jalla wa Ala had revealed this verse, and you'll find that he uses the surah in his salah, so on and so forth, but he doesn't know what it means. How do you expect change to happen within that person's life? 
How do you expect a person to be taken out of the realms of darkness toward light if that person doesn't understand the Qur'an? My dear brothers, the Qur'an, the most printed, the most read book on the face of this earth. The most printed, the most read book on the face of this earth. If you go to Medina al Munawwara, there is a place known as Mujamma Malik Fahad li Tiba' al Masaf al Sharif. There is a place where they print the Quran in Medina al Munawwara, Medina Quran printing press or complex, they, that's what they call it. They print 10 million copies every year of the Quran. 10 million copies since they opened their doors in 1985. 10 million copies every single year and they distribute those Qurans throughout the world and now perhaps they print even more because of the demand so more than 10 million copies are printed every year in 39 different languages the Qur'an so the most printed book on the face of this earth you can think about a book that is uh, of fiction or non-fiction how many books uh, or non-fiction or non-fiction books are printed in that large number none the Qur'an 10 million copies a year the most read book, while we're sitting here discussing about the Qur'an, there's someone in some part of the world or even here reciting the Qur'an. So there is not a moment where someone's not reciting the Qur'an. The most printed book, the most uh, recited book, something to be proud of. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it is the least understood book. Least understood book. The most printed, the most read, but unfortunately it's the, most, uh, it's the least uh, understood book. And Allah Jalla wa Ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do they not contemplate upon uh, the Qur'an, the message that this Qur'an carries? Do they not reflect upon the verses? Do they not reflect upon the message that these surahs carry? أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا or do they have locks upon their hearts? What is holding them back from uh, learning the message or acknowledging or realizing what the message of this surah is? And this is what intrigued Imam al-Tabari. The statement we said of Imam al-Tabari that inni a'jabu, I'm astonished, mimman qara' al-Qur'an, the one who reads the Qur'an, walam ya'lam ta'wilahu, and he doesn't know the meaning of uh, what he is reading. This is what intrigued Imam al-Tabari when he read this verse, afala yatadabbarun al-Qur'an, am ala qulubin aqfaluha. Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an or are there locks upon their hearts? This is what intrigued Imam al-Tabari to become a mufassir to become a commentator of the Qur'an. And we are benefiting from his tafsir till this day. A person who wanted to know what the message of the Qur'an was. Then at tabari says, كَيْفَ يَتَلَذُّ بِقِرَاءَتِهِ A person who reads the Qur'an, he doesn't understand its meaning, he doesn't understand the message the uh, ayah or the surah carries. كَيْفَ يَتَلَذُّ بِقِرَاءَتِهِ How is it that person will enjoy the Qur'an? Just mere recitation, there will be no passion, there will be no enjoyment because they don't understand what they're reading. Look at the approach of the companions. Radwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'een, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How was their relationship with the Qur'an? How was their approach towards the Qur'an? Hassan al-Basari rahimahullahu ta'ala, a, a, a renowned scholar who uh, died 110 Hijri. He says, إِنَّ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ رَأَوُ الْقُرْآنَ رَسَائِلْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ Imam Hassan al-Basari rahimahullah He says, so 110 Hijri he passed away, he's talking about the people before him. يعني the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِنَّ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ Those that came before us. He's speaking to his companions, Hassan al-Basari. He's saying, those that came before us. رَأَوُ الْقُرْآنَ They saw the Qur'an رَسَائِلْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ As a personal message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Abu Bakr as-Siddiq رضي الله عنه He thought that the Qur'an was speaking to him directly. Umar رضي الله عنه thought that the Qur'an was speaking to him directly. Each of those noble, profound companions, they considered the Qur'an to be a personal message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would recite the Qur'an during the night, during the day, excuse me, they would recite the Qur'an during the day and by the night they would implement the Qur'an. By the night they would recite the Qur'an, in the morning they would implement the Qur'an. This is how they lived their life. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he would read one verse, one verse only. Ibn Mas'ud, he would read it, understand it, reflect upon it and then move on to another verse. That was their approach towards the Qur'an. We read the Qur'an, MashaAllah, we open the Qur'an, Surah Fatiha, Surah Baqarah, Surah Nisa, we already finished. 
How much of that Quran have we understood? We're talking about Ibn Mas'ud, the man who spent a large amount of his life with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's stopping at every single verse. He's reading Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and he's looking at the tafsir, the ta'wil, and he's analyzing the verse properly before he moves on to Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. That was their approach towards the Quran. And that is why we can see their maqam compared to us, where their status is how they became noble and profound individuals. And it is said, وَكَانَ أَصْحَابُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ Some of the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم إِذَا التقوا, When they used to meet, لَمْ يَتَفَرَّقُوا They would not depart from one another. Two of the companions they would meet. مَثَلًا أَبُو بَكَّرْ would meet with Umar. Umar would meet with Uthman. Talha would meet with Zubair. When they were used to meet amongst themselves, just the way us brothers, when we meet one another, they would remind one another. إِذَا التَّقَوْا لَمْ يَتَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا بَعْدَ أَنْ يَقْرَأْ أَحَدُهُمَا عَلَى الْآخَرِ سُورَةَ الْعَصَرِ they would remind one another of the message of Surah Al-Asr. Very concise part of the Quran, Surah Al-Asr, right? It is said, Suratun Wajizatun Min Kitabillah. Very concise part of the Quran. Thalathu ayatin. Three verses only. Tatadammanu bayana asbab al khusrani wal ribah. Three verses only that consist of our loss and our gain. How we can attain the closeness of Allah and how we can become destructive. Just three verses within the Quran. When these two companions used to meet, إِذَا التَّقَوْ لَمْ يَتَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا بَعْدَ أَنْ يَقْرَى أَحَدُهُمَا عَلَى الْآخَرِ سُورَةَ الْعَصَرِ They used to remind one another of the message that Surah Al-Asr carries. وَذَلِكَ مِنْ أَجَلِ الْعَمَلِ بِهَا Was it just mere recitation? That one of them would recite to another, Wal-Asr, Inna al-Insana lafi khusr? No, it was with explaining what Surah Al-Asr was, the message that it carried. As Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, when speaking about uh, Wal-Asr, he says that if people were to contemplate and ponder upon just Surah Al-Asr, it would have been sufficient for them. The message, يعني, the do's and the don'ts, the need for us to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, refrain from immorality, so on and so forth. That was their approach with the Qur'an. That was their relationship with the Qur'an, the companions. Qala <laughs> Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he says, تَعَلَّمْنَا الْإِيمَان We learned what Iman was. From whom? From the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These were people that were swimming in immorality and indecency. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them hope, gave them life. After coming in contact with the beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had that transition from immorality and some of them became Amirul Mu'mineen. Some of them became leaders amongst the, amongst the believers like Umar ibn al-Khattab. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he says, ta'allamna al-Iman. We learned what Iman was from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After that, ثم تعلمنا القرآن. After that, we learned the Quran, not just mere recitation, but understanding the message that this Quran carried, implementing every verse within our life, like Ibn Masud radiAllahu anhu. Then he says, فأزددنا الإيمان. After that, we realize that our iman has increased. So the relationship between our iman and the Quran is rather the key in increasing our iman. As Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran, وإذا تليت عليهم آياته زادتهم إيمانا، and when the verses of the Quran are recited upon them، زادتهم إيمانا. so these are the people they learned what إيمان was from the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. we're speaking about a جليل صحابي، a very profound صحابي، عبد الله بن عمر. we learned what إيمان was. ثم تعلمنا القرآن. after that we understood the Quran. we looked at each verse. we studied the verse. we implemented it within our life. فأزددنا الإيمان. and a consequence of that was our iman started to increase. look at the relationship of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم with the Quran. and he is the best example upon whom the Quran was revealed. محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم when a group of people came to Aisha radiallahu anha and they inquired about the khuluq, the manners, the etiquettes of the Messenger alayhi salatu was salam. It's a well-known hadith. All of us are aware of this hadith. Ma'roof hadith. But what does this hadith mean? When Aisha radiallahu anha, she informed those people, that group that came, inquired about the khuluq, the characteristics or the manners of the Messenger alayhi salatu was salam. She responded, kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. That the Qur'an, the Messenger alayhi salam, was the walking example of the Qur'an. All the do's and the don'ts in the Qur'an, you could find that in the life of the Messenger alayhi salatu was salam. 
But let us look at this hadith through the explanation of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. To be able to understand this hadith in depth, we need Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah to explain this hadith to us. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, فَهَذِهِ كَانَتْ أَخْلَاقُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ this was the manners, etiquettes of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's explaining the relationship between the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Qur'an. Why Aisha, our beloved mother, Siddiqa bint Siddiq radiallahu anha, why she used the Qur'an as an analogy? How the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the walk in Qur'an? Why did she say this? Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, فَهَذِهِ كَانَتْ أَخْلَاقُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this was the manner, etiquettes of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-muqtabasa min mishkat al-Qur'an. That was extracted from the Qur'an. His manners, his etiquettes were all extracted from the Qur'an. They were taken out from the Qur'an. فَكَانَ كَلَامُهُ مُطَابِقًا لِلْقُرْآنِ his speech was in line with the Qur'an. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke, it was in line with the Qur'an. He never went against the Qur'an. Everything that he said, it was in line with the Qur'an. Ya'na the commandment of Allah jalla wa ala. Wa ulumihi ulum al-Qur'an. And the knowledge that he gave to people, the knowledge that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed on to his rightly guided companions, that knowledge was from the Qur'an. It wasn't something that was from his own desires, something that the Messenger وسلم, discovered outside of the Qur'an. No, when the Messenger وسلم, spoke, it was the words of the Qur'an. So the knowledge that he gave to his companions, those people, may they be Muslim of that time or whether they were a potential Muslim, he gave them knowledge from the Qur'an. His desires, his wants. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whatever he intended, it was in line with the Qur'an. Making sure that whatever he wanted, was it in the Qur'an? Did the Qur'an permit that? Did the Qur'an authorize that, allow that for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have? وَمُحَبَّةُ لِمَا أَحَبَّ Whatever the Qur'an loved, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved. So throughout the Qur'an, Allah jalla wa ala mentions how he loves the believers. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved the believers. And those that despise the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was strong in terms of his stance against those because the Qur'an speaks harshly of those people. Those people that gave the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a very hard time when he started to propagate the message of Tawheed. So, وَمَحَبَّةُ لِمَا أَحَبَّ Whatever the Qur'an loved, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved. وَسَعْيُهُ فِي تَنْفِيذِ أَوَامِرِهِ وَتَبْلِيغِهِ and he strived in establishing the commandments of the Qur'an. And we can see that through the life of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those of us who have re read uh, Zad al-Ma'ad, the, the provisions of the hereafter, a fantastic uh, biography of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the sealed nectar uh, by uh, Safi Rahman Mubarak Puri. To be uh, more precise, uh, the sealed nectar has really been extracted from Zad al-Ma'ad. A lot of the information has been taken from uh, Zad al Ma'ad Imam Ibn al Qayyim's work uh, on the life of the Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, if we study his life, we'll know that the Messenger sallallahu Alaihi strived, sacrificed the pleasures of this world in order to establish awamirihi, the commandments of Allah Jalla wa ala that were revealed to him, to him and in conveying those commandments to the people. Now we ask ourselves a very important question, uh, my dear brothers, a very important question. How is our relationship with the Qur'an? This is the most important question tonight. Wallahi, how is our relationship with the Qur'an? All of us open the Qur'an. Some of, some of us have a better relationship with the Qur'an than others. Some of us perhaps, wal-iyadhu billah, open the Qur'an once a month. Some of us perhaps fortnightly, some of us weekly, some of us every day. How is our relationship with the Qur'an? How is our approach when we open the Qur'an? What is our intention? As Imam Ibn al-Qayyim says, that the Qur'an should be understood, first understood. Then we need to reflect upon the verses, tadabbur. There needs to be tadabbur, reflection, contemplate. And then tanfid, then implement it within our life. When we open the Qur'an, my, my dear brothers, how many of us really understood, understand the message within the Qur'an? We need to ask ourselves that question. What's our excuse? That we don't know the Arabic language? The Qur'an is in 39 different languages. 
so many different translations. What's our excuse? We memorize, mashallah, very good step. We need to memorize the Quran. Have that connection with the Quran. But is, has the Quran been revealed for mere recitation and memorization? To take us out from the realms of darkness, towards light, take us away from immorality and indecency, towards guidance and that what is correct. We need to reflect and understand, understand the Quran properly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hashr, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hashr that had we revealed this Quran on a mountain had this Quran been revealed on a mountain لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله you would have seen the mountain humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the mountain would have crumbled, moved out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the mountain might be a peg that is used but it knows the maqam of the khaliq it knows who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the mountain Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he says Faya ajaba. he says I'm astonished Imam ibn al-Qayyim says I'm astonished that a mountain will be moved if the Quran was revealed on the mountain this is what Allah jalla wa is saying in surah Hashr he says Faya ajaba. how astonishing min mudghatin lahmin a, a flesh, a, a small piece of meat within the body, the most important component within the body, the heart, the nucleus of the body. This piece of flesh, Aqsa min hadhi al-jibal, is it more solid than that mountain? Is it more stronger than that mountain? Had that Quran been revealed on the mountain, it would have humbled itself, it would have moved, it would have crumbled. But this hard heart, this heart has no effect. It hears the verses of the Quran. It understands its meaning. It reflects. The verses are revealed upon that heart that we have, the important component within our body. But it's not affected. There is no effect. The mountain would move from its place. It will crumble. It will, it will be in a state of fear. Because he understands the maqam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given to his creation within this book. But this book has been revealed for who? For us. A personal message to each one of us. But we, subhanallah, so many excuses when it comes to understanding the Quran. We don't know the Arabic language. At this age, is it possible to learn the Arabic grammar, nahu sarf, all those difficult aspects? <coughs> so many excuses not to know the Quran. Imam al tabari rahimahullah, you think he became a mufassir uh, while he was in primary or secondary? Most of these ulama, they became scholars latter part of their life. Most of the ulama, they sacrificed all that they had. Like we said, Imam al nawawi rahimahullah, look at how he utilized his time that he had. The time that Allah Jalla wa ala has given us as a ni'mah. The time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question each one of us for. Are we utilizing that time? These are the questions, ya gama'a, we need to ask ourselves again and again. So Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rightfully says that, that if the Qur'an was revealed on the mountain, the mountain would move. But our hearts, subhanallah, fala talinu, wala taqsha. There is no fear. There is no movement within the heart. There is no effect. That is our state. How do you expect us uh, to have this change from immorality and come towards guidance. How do you expect our morals, our ethics, our characteristics, our behavior to change if we haven't approached the Qur'an the way the Prophet ﷺ approached the Qur'an, the way the Sahaba approached uh, the Qur'an. We need to revive our relationship, reconnect ourselves. Alhamdulillah, all of us have a relationship with the Qur'an on different levels. But as students of knowledge, that relationship needs to be much stronger. We need to re-establish that relationship and really assess our situation. No one knows better than themselves how, where we stand in terms of the Qur'an, our relationship with the Qur'an. We need to ask ourselves, Wallahi, tonight we need to ask ourselves where we stand in terms of our relationship with the Qur'an. And is there a need for us to reconnect with the Qur'an and then re-establish our relationship with the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladhina amanu. إن الذين يتلون كتاب الله وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية يرجون تجارة لن تبور الله سبحانه وتعالى says إن الذين يتلون كتاب الله those who recite the Quran وأقاموا الصلاة 
and those who established salah وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَّةً and they spend from the wealth that Allah Jalla wa ala has given them سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَّةً overtly and covertly discreetly and openly يَرْجُونَ تِجَارَةً لَن تَبُورُ hoping for a a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lan tabur. A reward where there, the, the, there is no loss. The Prophet is guaranteed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inna alladheena yatluna kitab Allah. Those who recite the Qur'an. Here, the word yatlu, yatluna is in mudari. If you study Arabic language, if you've studied Arabic language, the word yatluna is a, is a future tense, mudari, yatluna. And it is said in Arabic grammar, al mudari yufidu al istimrar. That, uh, the, the future tense word, it means a person does something continuously. So yatluna doesn't mean that the person read it once. It means that something that is continuous. Yufidu istimrar, something that happens often again and again. So the person who establishes salah, the person who establishes salah, the one who gives uh, from the wealth that he or she has, and the person who hopes for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are those yatluna al-kitab, they recite the Qur'an again and again and again and again. Shaykh al-Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatan wasi'a, he says yatluna means the person who recites the Qur'an with the meaning. So not just mere recitation. Here the word you'll find in the Qur'an when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word tilawa, it comes from the word tilawa, recitation you'll find yatluna throughout the Qur'an, it means with the meaning. Not just mere recitation where you recite the Quran, like Subhanallah. A lot of people from our community they merely recite the Quran for the purpose of thawab. Every letter carries ten. This is the sort of idea, general idea amongst the people that we read the Quran for every letter we have ten. That shouldn't be our approach towards the Quran. To understand it, because if we understand it, reflect upon it, implement it within our life, you're telling me the reward is just merely ten. It is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He is giving according to our intention. So if our intention is pure, if our heart's pure, to please Allah, to understand the Qur'an, to understand and to implement, the reward is beyond that. <coughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ Those who recite the Qur'an to understand it. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, بَلْ تَفَهُمْ مَعَانِيهِ هُوَ الْمَقْصُودُ الْأَوَّلِ Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, but rather to understand the meaning of the Qur'an, not just recitation, huwa al-maqsoodul awwal, that is the key purpose. That is the fundamental purpose. When we open the Qur'an, our key purpose as students of knowledge, it is our responsibility to open the Qur'an and to approach the Qur'an, and when we read it, to understand it with meaning. That was the approach of Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim. That was the approach of the Sahaba, then the Tabi'een, then the Tab Tabi'een, then the Aima Al-Mujtahideen, then the Salf Al-Salihin, then the Mutaakhireen. And all those generations that came after one another, all those people, they opened the Qur'an, Rasail Min Rabbihim, a personal message from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's how they approached the Qur'an. So now we need to embark on a very important journey of learning the Arabic language. And it's never late, my dear brothers. Fudail ibn Ayyad rahimahullah, a person, if you study his life, then you'll come to know. Subhanallah, <coughs> the latter part of his life he accepted the shahada. Fudail ibn Ayyad rahimahullah, uh, uh, who's a faqih, a well known faqih, who was a highway robber. Fudail ibn Ayyad rahimahullah, he would wait for the caravans to pass from one part of uh, the Arabian Peninsula to the other part. And then he would wait with his comrades or entourage, you could say, and then they would wait to loot the caravan until he came one day to uh, one of the caravans and he heard someone reciting, Alam amanu an bidhikrillah. Has the time not come for the believing hearts to be affected? And when he heard this uh, verse, he said, Fudail has repented. This is a message for me. Rasail min rabbihim. This is a personal message for me. One verse was sufficient to change this man from immorality and indecency, take him away from realms of darkness, to a person, a faqih whom we take fiqh from. If you open the books of fiqh, you will find waqala fudail, wa'an fudail, wa'an fudail, wa'an fudail. You will find fudail all over the books of fiqh. Rasail min rabbihin, those are the people. You think he uh, accepted his shahada when he was 15 or 20? Latter part of his life. And then he embarked on a journey where he learned the Qur'an, he learned other disciplines within Islamic theology, and he became such an elevated or noble person. So there is no excuse for us. 
when it comes to the Arabic language, especially living uh, in this country where there's uh, so many courses available for us to learn Arabic language. And I know, mashallah, some of the brothers here who are quite advanced and you've studied in Egypt, mashallah, we need to embark on those journeys. There is no excuse. The word excuse, wallahi, comes from shaitan. That word excuse is from shaitan. The amount of excuses that we have within our life, we need to eradicate those excuses and embark on that journey on learning the Arabic language. And Allah will make it easy, ya gama'ah. If you take a step towards Allah, to please Him solely, Allah will provide you with sources. Allah will provide a, or make it easy for you from sources you perceive not. Make it very easy for us. But the people who recognize this, the need to go and learn Arabic language, the people that consider this to be wajib and not something voluntary, nafal, the people who are geared up here, people that think objectively, people that think purposefully, people who are wise, they are the people, the people with pure heart. As Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, he used to say, قَالَ Uthman ibn Affan, لَوْ أَنَّا قُلُوبَنَا طَهُرَتْ مَا شَبِعَتْ مِنْ كَلَامِ رَبِّنَا Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, he used to say, if the hearts are pure, they are eager to learn, if they are hungry for this knowledge, if they are hungry to earn the love of Allah, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will embark on that journey. They will eradicate those excuses and they will say, you know what, this is my religion, this is wajib upon me, this is not voluntary and nawafil. I need to embark on this journey and learn in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that heart is awake, qalbun hay, if it's awake, if it's pure, ma shabi'at min kalami rabbina, it will never be satisfied with the, with the Qur'an, it would want more. Learn more of the Qur'an, learn more of Islamic theology, whatever subject it is, hadith, fiqh, usul, whatever it is. They will always be hungry to learn all those disciplines. That is a sign of a person who is thinking object objectively, purposefully. Because they know the life of this world is temporary, ya gama'a. A blink of an eye if you compare it to the hereafter. And the real life will begin from the moment that we close our eyes. All of us are aware of this. We all give nasiha to others about this. But when it comes to really implementing, implementing this within our lives, we're quite heedless. So we need to really take action, not just be people of speech, but rather people of action. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, while he was passing on his khilafah to Umar ibn al-Khattab, he gave him a very important nasiha. He said to him, let us be people of fa'al, not people of qawwal, not people of speech. Let us be people of action. When we hear something, we implement it within our lives. That was the companions. One verse of the Qur'an was sufficient to change Fudayl ibn Ayyad. One verse was sufficient to change Umar ibn al-Khattab. One verse was sufficient to change all those noble people who were here and they became here. Because they thought objectively. They knew their real purpose, their goal, what their purpose was in the life of this world. So if we claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to re-establish our relationship with the Qur'an. And we'll conclude, inshallah, uh, here. Point number two, inshallah, uh, we'll go on that next week. We'll cover it quickly, two and three. I don't think this, if we cut it short, we'll be able to do justice to this top uh, point number one, inshallah. So we'll finish with the statement of Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, Man ahabba. Oh, okay, fi waqt. Shukran. Okay, inshallah. So let us look at the statement of uh, uh, Uthman, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he actually uh, hits the nail on the head. Uh, this uh, particular statement really uh, brings to surface our topic. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says, Man ahabba an yuhibba Allahu wa rasooluh. The one who loves, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him and the Messenger of Islam love him. The one who desires, the one who wishes to be loved by who? His Khaliq, his Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and by the beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, falyanzur, then let him focus, let him reflect. فَإِنْ كَانَ يُحِبُّ الْقُرْآنِ If that person loves the Qur'an. So if a person claims that he loves Allah and his messenger, this is the statement of Ibn Mas'ud, the man who used to study one verse at a time. So he knows his Qur'an very well. And how he built his relationship with the Qur'an, how he became close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he became close to the messenger alayhi salatu was salam. Mm, he says, naam. Man ahabba an yuhibba Allah wa rasooluh. The one who wishes to be loved by Allah and his messenger, falyanzur, let him reflect. Let him reflect. فَإِنْ كَانَ يُحِبُّ الْقُرْآنِ 
if that person loves the Quran, if he has a very strong bond, mithaqan ghalidha, a very strong bond with the Quran, فَهُوَ يُحِبُّ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ He loves Allah and, his, and the Messenger, and the Messenger of Allah and Allah Jalla wa'ala love that person. That is the statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, subhanallah bihamd. What a profound statement. That we claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to be loved. So you can claim to love someone, but the love needs to be from the other side. To attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to love the Qur'an, the everlasting legacy that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or we can say mu'jaza, miracle, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has left behind for us to take us out of the realms of darkness towards light. So again and again, my dear brothers, we question ourselves, and that is muhasaba, self-sabotaging ourselves, holding us account, holding ourselves account our relationship with the Qur'an, how we can strengthen our relationship with the Qur'an, what are the steps that we need to take in order for us to strengthen our relationship with the Qur'an. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he takes or he brought this point as number one. Why? Because the Qur'an is the key in attaining the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is rather the door of all the other points that we will go through, inshaAllah. If we talk about dhikr, if we talk about taqwa, if we talk about sabr, all those important aspects of belief, the Qur'an is rather the remedy of all those uh, important aspects of belief. And people that will study the Qur'an in depth, with meaning, reflect upon it, and then implement it within their lives, those are the people that will see the fruit from the Qur'an. And that is the, the, the approach of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his Sahaba, and all those people that came after them. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he wrote a book, and he called it At-Tibyan fi Aqsam al-Qur'an, a fantastic book. Uh, if you read Arabic, then that's a book that we need to purchase, At-Tibyan fi Aqsam al-Qur'an. Or there are other books, uh, insha'Allah, that are available in English. Allahu alam, uh, you might want to look for those titles, insha'Allah. But al uh, aqal minimum, what we need to do is at least find a specific tafsir, a very easy and good tafsir, well-known tafsir, like Ibn Kathir, a tafsir bil ma'thur. So a tafsir that has been done in line with the hadith. So the, Ibn Kathir, he explained the whole tafsir using statements of the Prophet Islam and the companions, making this tafsir very strong and very ma'roof, very accepted. Or oh, Tabari, uh, Tabari had, did the same approach as well. He took the statements of the Sahaba as well as hadith of the Prophet Islam to make the, the, the commentary very strong. Or oh, Qurtubi, Qurtubi is very good. Uh, however, the tafsir is in line with fiqh. So Imam Al-Tabari, he explains all the verses of fiqh and every time he brings a verse, he would explain the fiqhi aspect of it. So the tafsir are different, but Ibn Kathir, mashallah, if you get the Darus Salam print, it's, 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 it's a collection we need to have on our shelves. And we need to start opening uh, those tafsir, inshallah, from Surah Fatiha. Surah Fatiha. We might think that, subhanallah, we've read Surah Fatiha many times within our life. Salah, la salata bi Fatiha al kitab. There is no salah without Surah Fatiha. We've read it many times. But have we really understood uh, the real meaning of Surah Fatiha? Let us analyze Surah Fatiha. Why did Allah say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen? Arabic grammar, you can say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. There is no harm in saying Alhamdulillah. If I say to my fellow brother, Alhamdulillah, there is no khata. Khata al lafzi there is no grammatical mistake here. But why did Allah say Alhamdulillah? Why did he bring this Alif Lam at Ta'rif to make it specific? So on so forth. All these aspects, Hamd, what's the difference between Hamd and Shukr? Mal Farq bain Alhamd and Shukr, what's the difference? Why didn't Allah say Ash-Shukru Lillahi Rabbil Alameen? Why did he say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen? Why Ar-Rahman Rahim, not Rahman Rahim? See, when we start analyzing it in that approach, then SubhanAllah, the fruits are on a different level. You, you, the relationship with the Qur'an is on a different level. And when you start to pray, then subhanAllah, you'll, you'll find that talazuz. You will find that passion, the sweetness within salah, when we understand what we are actually saying within our salah. And if we, subhanAllah, this question might arise, why is it that many, uh, they pray salah, or they read the Qur'an, but yet they find themselves indulging in immorality, indecency, doing unlawful things, when in the Qur'an, I mean in the salah, they're saying, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, and then when you look at their actions, subhanAllah, it worries, it warrants the question whether they are really uh, saying Allahu Akbar. Because through their actions, it seems like they're saying Allah is, is not the greatest. Because they're giving preference to things in the life of this world over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because people don't understand what they're saying in salah. Salatul Witr, for example, I'll give you an example. Salatul Witr, in Salatul Witr, we say, 
Um, there is a dua, masnoon dua. There are many duas we uh, read in Salatul Witr. Uh, one of those duas is Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nasta'afiruka. There are other duas, Allahumma ahdina fi man ahdayt, Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna al-khad. There are many. But the common one is Allah, uh, Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nasta'afiruka. In that particular masnoon dua, we say, wa naturuku man yafjuruka. Oh Allah, I disconnect myself with all those people who don't feel any shame to commit any sin against you. وَنَتْرُكُ مَنْ يَفْجُرُكَ I disconnect my relationship with the Fajr, the one who has no shyness, who feels no regret or remorse uh, in violating the commandment of Allah Jalla wa'ala. After our Salah, who do we befriend? At times we find many that they pray, MashaAllah, they're praying, they lengthen their prayer, very nice prayer. But as soon as they concluded their Salah, which environment are they in? With the people that are Fajr, Fasiq, those people that are holding our hands towards Jahannam, not Jannah. Those people are not helping us come uh, closer to Allah and attain the love of Allah. So had we understood what we are saying within Salah, if we actually made that dua, wa natruku man yafjuruka wallah, I actually disconnect myself with all those people that openly commit sin against you. See, our Salah would be different. Our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be different. So may Allah make it easy for us, insha'Allah, Aziz. Give us the tawfiq. Uh, and of course, dua, ya gama'ah. We need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the key, insha'Allah. We make continuous dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to open our hearts and to really give us the ability to understand this Qur'an, insha'Allah, Aziz. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa barik wa sallam. Barakallahu feek, inshaAllah. Hayyakum Allah. Hayyakum Allah. We're going to have a little session of questions. InshaAllah. Barakallahu feek. Do you always have any questions for the Ustaz? Don't be shy. Everybody in there somewhere. I think it's best sometimes when we when we take knowledge. Uh, if you have a question, uh, then I'll tell you in a second. We'll write it down somewhere and then we can come up. Because you can remember because sometimes I know I have the habit of today and I think it out. Uh, so, Brother Nakib, you can ask me, Shaykh. Ahlan wa sahlan, Shaykh. Some of us, we find that there's a barrier to, we feel that there's a mental barrier towards reciting the Quran. Whether it's laziness, or whether it's family, or whether it's other things in the world. <coughs> Apart from du'a, which is obviously the first thing we should be doing mm. to overcome that barrier, what other tips? Could you give what other solutions are there to this problem that we may feel? Hmm. In terms of uh, the barrier, uh, I mean, uh, barrier is something uh, that can be eradicated by every individual. Barrier is just like an excuse. Like we said, all those barriers and excuses, uh, feel free to disagree with me. I think they're tools of shaitan. Because when it comes to our priority, when it comes to our awlawiyya, that what is essential for us, wallahi, there is no excuses, there is no barrier. Because the Qur'an is something that needs to be understood. It's not something that we put on the shelf and when we come to the masjid and we read it. No, the Qur'an is something that needs to be understood, hence we need to take that proactive step in learning the Qur'an. At times, like you said, living uh, the life that we live in in this uh, country here is difficult. We have family life, kids, work, so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> we need to have a plan. If you, fail to, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Simple as that. There needs to be a proper structured plan of how you approach the Qur'an, uh, even if it means 20 minutes a day. One of my teachers he used to say to me, uh, recite the Qur'an 10 minutes. He said to me, I'm not going to be uh, too strict, just 10 minutes a day. Just 10 minutes a day. And you come back to me after two years or a year and you'll tell me the difference. Just 10 minutes, you'll open it and 10 minutes, how much are you going to read? Not that much, a few pages. And then you see the difference afterwards. So these are the small tips, small uh, notes or gems, you can say, that will open the door for us. But I mean, we need to take that proactive step and recognize that there is a need for us to attach ourselves with the Qur'an. If we don't, then we find ourselves in so much debate amongst ourselves, discussion amongst ourselves, so much difference amongst ourselves because we've turned away from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So inshallah, I think 
uh, على الأقل minimum what we need to do is proactive and uh, acknowledge the need for us to understand the Quran even with all those barriers wallahi there is no excuse if we can give time to our family uh, we can give time to the Quran if we can give time to our family we can give time to Allah man ahabba an yuhibb Allah wa rasuluh ibn masud says the one who would uh, who loves to be loved by Allah and his messenger he or she needs to be very proactive inshallah Allah says barakallahu feek فضل الله I think there needs to be a fine balance أخي. تحفيز is very important okay the one who loves the Quran the one who pours the Quran within his or her heart that heart is pure Ibn Kathir rahimahullah as I was discussing with my dear brother here he says that the one who finds himself attached to the Quran that is a good sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who comes to the masjid and then he has two minutes in, or five minutes and he opens the Quran and he thinks okay I'm going to utilize that time to read the Quran no the person who comes earlier to read the Quran so intentionally comes to read the Quran that person uh, is, is eager to learn uh, subhanallah it's gone from my mind what you said Akhi. repeat yeah, so, barakallahu feek. so in terms of uh, tahfiz and in terms of uh, tadabbur or uh, tafahum, to learn or to contemplate, there needs to be a fine balance between both. So if there's a group of people who spend their lifetime just learning the meaning but they have no Quran within them. And there's those, mashallah, we can see our uh, scholars from Bangladesh or Pakistan, majority, mashallah, a large number of people who've memorized the Quran but they don't know what it means. So they're not able to really take the real fruits from it. So there needs to be a fine balance. There needs to be that consistent uh, tahfiz, memorization of the Qur'an. At the same time, if you're memorizing, uh, look at the meaning of what's been memorized. So if you've memorized Surah Baqarah, and if you look at the meaning of it, mashallah, when you read uh, the Surah within your Salah, it'll be more fruitful. So fine balance between both. I wouldn't say tafahum is uh, more superior to uh, tahfiz. Fine balance between both, inshallah. Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station.